Hi all, I am Daniela Sade and I'm a research fellow at the Institute of Cosmology and Gravitation in Portsmouth. I'm going to start by giving you a few words about what we're doing and why. It is a general feature of theories that attempt to explain, to give a solution to the cosmological constant problems to come with extra scalar fields. The moment you introduce one extra scalar particle, you have also introduced a mediator of one extra scalar force. So before we go on, you could already ask yourself, do we see any extra forces experimentally? And the first answer you could give is a crushing no. So what I'm showing you here is what happens when on Earth or in the solar system, you allow for a fifth force to be there in addition to the Newtonian force. And as you can see, what all of these experiments have done has been excluding more and more of the parameter space. So is this the end of the story at slide three? Actually, no, because it turns out what has really been excluded is just the simplest possible model. So what's wrong with the simplest model? To start with, the one scalar field that we know that exists, which is the Higgs boson, doesn't behave in this way. And second, from a theoretical point of view, in some sense, you need to know why you have to restrict to this. So it turns out that if you allow for a more general phenomenology, and in particular, if you allow for non-trivial self-interactions, for instance, those that the Higgs has, then your fifth force may, be, may have a more phenomenologically interesting behavior. And in particular, it may be environment dependent so that it can be screened, which means suppressed in some environments where we know that it has to be small. So going back to the model I was showing earlier of uh, Newtonian gravity plus one extra fifth force of a finite range, what this basically means is that, for instance, you can make decoupling to matter environment dependent, or perhaps it's the range of your force that depends on the environment, or if MS is a source mass, it's the way in which the force comes into the equation regulating your fifth force that's more complicated. So instead of depending linearly, like before, perhaps it's a more complicated form. In this talk, I will focus on Weinstein screening. In Weinstein screening, it's like your fifth force behaves according to different laws depending on the environment. And I will show an example of how this can happen. So here I'm showing you the equation for standard gravity. So this is the Poisson equation that we all know. And below is the equation regulating a model called cubic Galileo. And it's just the simplest model displaying in Weinstein screening. Consider a situation where you have a massive source in space. It turns out that closer to the massive source, these terms in aquamarine dominate, whereas further away from the source, the standard white terms dominate. It turns out that this means that closer to the source, your scalar force is weaker in gravity and scales like the radius to the two thirds. Whereas further away from the source, outside of the Weinstein radius, the standard behavior is recovered and your scalar force scales like gravity. Now here is the problem. Theories with Weinstein screening typically have a very small limit of validity compared to general relativity. For instance, they can be valid up to a, a scale that's kilometer scale. The usual reasoning is that this is not a problem because your theory with Weinstein screening is just an effective field theory of a more complete theory. So it doesn't matter if it breaks down too early, there's going to be a bigger and better theory that takes in. However, the problem is that if you've got specific higher order kinetic terms that are large and dominant, then you're out of a perturbative regime. But at the same time, you're saying this non-standard term is dominant and macroscopic. That's a bit odd because either you are perturbative or small or you are macroscopic and dominant. And if, spe if specific higher order kinetic terms are large, then you're out of a perturbative regime. And in fact, you can start wondering how come these higher order terms are macroscopically important, but a whole plethora of other higher order kinetic terms are not. Mm -hmm. And this is an important question because if these other terms are also important, it's quite possible that we'll cancel with this one or produce something else that you don't expect. And the truth is that you don't know, and you can only really tell if you know the full UV sector. So if you know this true fundamental theory that governs your field, then only in that case, you know whether 
this particular non-standard terms is dominant and somehow all the other aren't. So let's then give a more accurate picture of Einstein screening. You will have a region where the standard terms dominate. You will have a region where your classical non-linearities dominate. These are the, the terms that give rise to your Einstein screening. And you have a third region, which is that where the quantum corrections are important and the classical theory breaks down. And so one key question is, where do you expect these quantum corrections to become important? Is it even before or after your classical nonlinearities have had the time to dominate? And for theories with Weinstein screening, you can distinguish between two main scenarios. The first is that of the so-called lambda three theories. So in this case, you expect your classical nonlinearities to kick in before your quantum corrections become important. However, the standard way we have our UV completing theories is not possible. And the second scenario is that of the so-called lambda five theories. So in this case, the standard UV completion is possible. However, you have the suspicion that your quantum corrections may become important before your classical nonlinearities do. So then this is our goal, to take a theory with Weinstein screening and compare it against its UV completion, one of its potential UV completions, to see if the screening survives this extension. UV complete theories are not exactly easy to come by, but fortunately for us, a few years ago, these people produced a theory that's very good for what we need. This is a theory of two coupled massive scalar fields, one of which is self-coupled, and as you can see, there are important higher order kinetic terms. Now, this is a good theory because you can look at the low energy limit, see if it screens, see if the UV complete theory screens, see if they look anything like each other. And these are the equations of motion that you get from that theory. And in order to find out if it screens, we need to solve them. And as you can see, they're quite complicated. An equivalent way of saying this is, let's consider the low energy limit of this theory. So, Let's take this equation for the most massive scalar field. Let's substitute it into this other equation. Let's express the result in terms in, in, into powers of the mass of the heavy field. And let's replicate it at some order. So what happens to this low energy theory? Does it look the same as the high energy theory? And this is actually equivalent to saying, this series of operators, does it converge? So then this is the goal of this work. Let's look at the low energy theory and the UV complete theory. Let's see if they look anything like each other. And let's see which one, if any, displays Weinstein screening. And let's also compute this tower of operators to see if the series converge, if the perturbative approach was appropriate in the first place. Now, you may have noticed that the equations um, behind this theory are kind of complicated. And so in some sense, we are faced with uh, a problem that's very familiar to physicists, which is the difference between the spherical cow, which is our favorite model of reality, and reality reality. And in this case, in fact, we've got complex planetary conditions, complex equation, large nonlinearity, sharp transitions. It's a mess. The way in which we are going to address this mass in order to reach our goal is by using the finite element method. It's a good method to address this specific type of mass and move away from the spherical cow. So I will now discuss the method. We have developed our own code. It's called Phyanix and it builds on the Phoenix library. And Phyanix is a finite element code that solves the full equation of motion of the theories that I've showed you. And in my intent, when I developed it, I, I developed it in such a way that uh, potential users could easily modify the code to solve their own problems of screening. Whether I succeeded or not, this is up to you to tell. That was my intention. When you want to solve equations in a computer, you must, first of all, turn something that's continuous and infinite into something that's discrete and finite. So the first step is to discretize the space over which your solution, your field profiles live. Now, one key advantage of the finite element method is that this discretization doesn't need to be uniform. 
So for instance, compared to other techniques that are commonly used in cosmology, like uh, finite differencing techniques, we don't have this problem. Your discretization can be as complicated as you like. And in this particular case, uh, the discretization is especially contrived. So you have seen that even a uh, shape of dolphin was carved out of this mesh. The second step is to discretize the function space. So over this discretized domain, you're going to express your functions in terms of basis functions and some coefficients. For concreteness, you can imagine that your basis functions are polynomials. So for instance, in our case, we use Lagrange polynomials, but this doesn't need to be. It can be more general, okay? So please remember this though, you're going to expand your functions into basis functions and some coefficients. I will need this very soon. Then the next step is turn your original equation in its so-called strong form into the weak form. And in order to illustrate what this means, I'm going to consider the hello world of partial differential equations, which is the Poisson equation, like gravity, for instance. So we will have here a, uh, your differential equation, your Dirichlet boundary condition, so conditions where you specify the value of the function in specific parts of the domain, your Neumann boundary condition, where you specify the value of the gradient of your function in specific parts of the domain. And this will give you your, your problem that you're trying to solve. Instead of asking that your solution satisfies the equation in an absolute sense, you can satisfy the weak formulation of the equation. So you ask that your equation holds with respect to a set of so-called test functions to all of them. What this means is that you take the scalar product against this test, uh, these test functions and ask that this equality, this scalar product equality holds for all test functions. Now, clearly this is a weaker condition than the original one. But one of the reasons why this is helpful is that this, um, this weak form is actually well suited to cases where your source is discontinuous or where it's not even a function, it can be a distribution for instance. The scalar product is often an integral when you consider functions. In our case, we take the Euclidean scalar product. Now we have an integral and this is quite nice because we can use it to lower the order of derivatives. Now, those who do numerics know that derivatives are noisy. And so if you can lower the order, it's nice. So we can integrate by part and we can express the, the boundary term in terms of the Neumann boundary condition. So this is also quite nice because then your Neumann boundary condition is incorporated in the way you express the equation and you don't need to enforce it by hand. Now, I would like to draw your attention to a fact. We've turned our partial differential equation into a bilinear form on the left-hand side and a linear form on the right-hand side. So on the left-hand side, we've got a bilinear form of your target solution and a test function. And on the right, we've got a linear form of the test function alone. Now, why is this amazing? Well, if you remember from your linear algebra, bilinear and linear functions, once you define them on a basis, they're defined everywhere. Now, if you also remember that we had discretized our function space in such a way that functions were expressed in terms of basis functions and coefficients, then maybe you can see why this is actually quite cool. Because the moment we compute our linear form in terms of uh, our, our target solution and um, the test function, we can actually pull out the coefficients of the expansion and leave the result of this bilinear and linear form on the basis alone. And this is a matrix and this is a vector, which means that we've turned our original horrible partial differential equation into an algebraic system of the kind that you solve in high school. So what you're really solving here is the coefficients of your target solution in terms of the discretized basis. Personally, I think this is really elegant. Now, there's only one remaining step, and it is that the equations that we solved are not the Poisson equation. They are not the hello world. They are horrible nonlinear equation. So the way this is addressed is by using a nonlinear solver. 
And in particular, we use the Newton method, which is a, uh, an iterative method in which uh, you solve a linear equation at every step, a linearized equation at every step until you reach the solution to your original nonlinear equation uh, once you converge. Now, before I show you the results of this work, I'm going to basically uh, give you some, a few examples as to why this is a good method and this is a good thing to do. What I'm showing you here is uh, a case that essentially we chose because it was difficult. It chose a case in which uh, the masses of the two fields are quite similar and also quite similar to the scale of the source fucking transition. So for the heavy field, we've got that its quantum wavelength is inside of the source and just 10 times smaller. And for the light field, we've got that its quantum wavelength is just 10 times larger than the, than the source radius. So scales are a little bit degenerate here and we deliberately chose this problem because it's difficult. Now it turns out because the heavy field is not an eigenstate of the linear operator, you will have mixing of the two fields. And therefore, you expect that some features will be excited by the source vacuum transition in the gradient of the heavy field. So, to be clear, this is not new physics. This is something that you expect, but it is really, really, really difficult to characterize even numerically. So to give an idea, in this case, to uh, characterize this theory accurate, I've chosen a box that was 10 to the 9, the source vacuum transition. And yet, because we can choose where to put the lattice sites, we can solve for these tiny, tiny, tiny features around the source vacuum transition, just around the source radius, despite the fact that we've got a huge box. And here I'm showing you how the terms in the equation change as you um, change the mass of the heavier field always for the same mass of the uh, lighter field. But then this is the real thing. So uh, here I'm showing you the result from one of the horrible operators. So as you show, as you can see here, I'm computing the Laplacian of Laplacian to the power of seven. And we are actually able to, to solve all of these different behaviors in the theory, the ones where the light field dominates, the ones where the light, heavy field dominate, and all the subcases uh, quite accurately, even though the, the operators is quite difficult. And now is the time finally for some results. So do the two theories look anything like each other? Does the UV complete theory screen? What happens to the tower of operators? Does it converge? And the answer is that the two theories look nothing like each other. So here, what I'm showing you is the ratio of the fifth force to the Newton force for the two different theories. And as you can see, the low energy theory screens quite a lot. So you can have actually a suppression up to 10 to the minus eight uh, times the Newton force for the scalar force. And instead, the UV complete theory doesn't screen at all. And it looks like the IR theory actually starts to break down precisely around the Weinstein radius. So the Weinstein radius is simultaneously the radius at which your nonlinearities are supposed to kick in and screen, but it looks like it's also the scale at which the limit of validity of your low energy theory ceases to be. So it's also the place where you should stop trusting your low energy theory because you are beyond its limit of validity. And here I'm looking at the same thing from a different angle. Let's look at the tower of operator. And here I'm showing you four orders of this operator. And as you can see, within the Weinstein radius, the second order operator is dominant on the first, the third is dominant on the second, and so on, which means that the whole perturbative approach has broken down. This series is not converging, which means you can't trust it. So to summarize and conclude, Weinstein screening is an effective mechanism to hide the fifth force in high density regions. And it's characterized by quite complicated equations that have made it difficult to understand what's going on in the screening mechanism. We developed a finite element code to, for the full numerical solution of the equations of screening. And we've applied it to a problem where we've compared a theory of massive Galileans against a potential UV completion to see if the screening was surviving this, the extension. And we found that it doesn't. So this means that it's unclear that Weinstein screening can be invoked within the limits of validity of the theories that make use of it. And with this, I conclude. Thank you for your attention.